Hey there, AP Physics students. This is Mr. Barry. Today we're going to run through the AP Physics uh, Unit 2 Dynamics notes uh, to make sure that you have the info that you need to get into this unit. So I'm going to jump right into it. We're just going to get rolling. Um, to start us off, we're going to look at our big ideas. And so the big ideas for dynamics, we've expanded upon a little bit from what we had in kinematics. We're looking actually at forces, and that's going to drive really what's happening through the rest of the unit and the rest of the class. And uh, it also does drive kinematics that we've already looked at, and we'll talk about how that's going to happen through this unit as well. So big idea one, objects and systems have properties such as mass and charge. We're really going to be looking at mass specifically which really is just to say that to apply a force to something, that something must have a mass associated with it. Uh, we're also going to look at fields existing in space and how they can explain interactions, largely the gravitational field that surrounds all objects with mass. And we talked a little bit about that in kinematics as well. We're going to look at the interactions of an object with another object and how that can be used to describe by, be described by forces. And that's really what makes forces happen at all is interactions between objects. And then we'll see how they result in changes in those systems as well. So we'll jump back to this at the end. I just want you thinking about these before we get into this material. First thing we need to do is define a force. So a force is defined as a push or pull on an object resulting from the object's interaction with another object. They only exist because of those interactions. Objects don't have forces exerted on them or exert uh, forces on other objects without there being some sort of interaction. And you might be thinking, what about gravity? We'll get a little more to that in a second, but there's such a thing as a non-contact force also. So it all interacts with each other. That's really what the universe is made up of is, is interactions between different objects that thus have forces associated with them. There is a net force um, that we want to make sure that we focus on in most cases here, and the net force is going to be the combination of two or more forces acting on an object, and we see a couple scenarios here. Uh, to point out quickly, we, we mentioned a push or a pull, and so everything you're seeing here is push or pull, and the two on the right are just a push or a pull on the individual objects that they're looking at, whereas that one on the left there is a push and a pull, and that's really the big difference, and that's what we want to put together here, right? The two on the right, it would just be, okay, the force of the pull on the rope, the force of the push on the wheelbarrow. But on the left here, we actually have the force of a pull and a push, and they're going in the same direction, so we'd want to calculate our net force in this case. There's quite a few categories of forces. Well, quite a few, really, two, And there's four major long-range forces that we'll look at here also. We're going to deal mainly with contact forces in this class just because most types of forces that are going to interact with objects are contact forces. But we're going to hit the long-range ones also, and there's one that's very prevalent that we will be talking about all the time. So a contact force is the force that results from two objects touching each other. You push on an object, it pushes back on you, and we'll get a little more into that coming up also. But any objects that touch then exert some force on each other. A long-range force is going to be applicable when objects are not touching. And the biggest example for that will be gravity, right? If I toss an object up into the air, as we looked at in kinematics, it's going to take that parabolic shape. It's going to come back down to Earth because the force of gravity is pulling on it, even though those objects aren't actually touching. So that would be a long-range force. Equilibrium is going to be a state when the net force is zero. And that's going to be very important for what we're going to cover in this class also. So we'll get much more depth in depth with that. But, uh, but it's important to realize that that's a state where the net force on an object is zero. I can push here, I can push here. If I push them together and I'm pushing with both hands and there's no motion, then I have an equilibrium state. So a net force of zero. Looking at our long range forces here, um, to say that these are long range forces is really to say that these ones are non-contact forces because you do see that the range specified for the bottom two are short and those bottom two forces are really things that hold atoms together and items like that. More chemistry than actual, well, I shouldn't say than physics because everything is physics, but um, it's more of a chemistry topic in general. Um, whereas the top two, the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force, those are things that we will definitely cover in here. Now notice gravitational force is very, very weak in comparison to the other two or the other three, excuse me. Um, so that's something to note there. It covers a much longer distance and it can be, um, acting on objects over much greater distances, but it overall is going to be a weaker force in that relative strength. Electromagnetic force we'll cover in our electricity unit towards the end of the class, and then strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force. Again, those are the things that hold the little pieces and atoms and on a very small scale together. And so it's very important that they're as relatively high strength as they are, because otherwise everything literally falls apart.
Uh, I want to show you some types of forces and the symbols associated with them. I'm not going to go through every one of these. We'll get into these as we get into practice and as we use things through this class. This is kind of a reference for you to come back to later if you need to. But an important note here is you've got your type of force on the left, and every single one of those has a symbol associated with it. They all begin with a capital F and then have a subscript that explains what the force is. Now, the ones that you're seeing there are really the common ones, but to be totally honest, you could put a capital F and describe it as, I mean, if it was, if a car ran into a pole, you could put F car, and that would be the force of the car on the pole and so forth and so on, right? You could really define them as anything you wanted. So there's really an infinite number here that you could put down, but the ones that you see are ones that you might see commonly and, uh, and are important to, to have some idea that they're going on there. Thrust being the one that you may not have heard of before, but a thrust force is the force generated by an engine. And so a car has a thrust force, a rocket has a thrust force. Any, any force generated by an engine is typically referred to as a thrust force. You see the definition of each right there, and then the direction that they act in as well. And that'll be important, but more important once we get into drawing our diagrams and really looking at how these forces interact. We need to get into Newton's laws because this is how we really define forces to begin with. So uh, Newton's laws are going to be really important throughout this whole um, unit and, and something that we want to make sure that, uh, that we keep in mind and we state early. So Newton has three laws. The first one is commonly known as the law of inertia. And so I'm actually going to jump down to that bottom line and explain what inertia is real quick first. Inertia is the ability of an object to resist change in its state of motion. Okay. The ability of an object to resist change. So if I have um, a little piece of paper and I push it, it's going to move quickly. So it doesn't have a very good ability to resist change. We would say it has low inertia. If there was a boulder in the middle of my classroom and I tried to push it, it's going to resist change a lot. So in a lot of cases, inertia and mass are very, very similar. And for what we'll do, at least in this unit, they're pretty much the same thing. So let's read our full Newton's law here, the first one. An object at rest will remain at rest unless acted on by an unbalanced force. An object in motion continues in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And you've probably heard something similar to this, but this is the full law and this is stating all the details to it. So um, it's important to realize what this is saying is things that aren't moving tend to stay that way unless a force acts on them. Things that are moving tend to stay that way unless a force acts on them, okay? So we see an example of this right here. And um, yep, this guy's not wearing a seatbelt and that's bad news, right? But we've got a person in a car. There's some force and thrust driving the engine of the car here. And so the car is moving and it gets into another force that acts on it, the force of the wall as it runs into it. A couple things are happening as a result of that. And they're kind of opposites to some degree, right? There is an unbalanced force acting on the car, which is changing its motion. It's causing it to stop and even move backwards to some degree, right? The person is continuing along their previous line of motion, okay? Maybe they're hitting their foot on the windshield and going flipping because of it, but they're continuing forward, which implies immediately they weren't wearing a seatbelt. If they're not wearing that seatbelt, they're going to continue in motion and keep going, even though the car has stopped. This is why seatbelts were created, is to help stop you with the car when the car stops. Otherwise, you hit something right in front of you, whether it be a wall, a windshield, so forth and so on. So, wear your seatbelt. All right, Newton's second law. Um, this one is probably easiest explained as an equation, but let's talk about what's actually happening first. So, it says acceleration is produced when a force acts on a mass. So, acceleration, an increase or decrease in velocity is produced when a force acts on a mass. The greater the mass, the greater the amount of force needed to accelerate. So those two sentences right there can very easily be explained with two lines and three letters, F equals MA. So a mass accelerates when a force acts on it, right? That F, force, it is in Newtons. Newtons are the uh, measurement that we're going to use for force going forward. They are, I don't want to say equivalent, but relative to pounds. You might have heard, okay, you have a weight in pounds. Um, and and that's, that's true. It's a different system of measurement. We're not going to use that. But if you think of the force of gravity acting on someone, a weight, then that's been measured in pounds probably for you in your past. It's going to be Newtons for this. M is the mass in kilograms. 
And uh, again, kilograms there, one of the few that actually starts with some sort of prefix, keep that in mind, that is a thousand grams. And A acceleration, as you know, is meters per second squared. A very common mistake is confusing force in newtons and mass in kilograms. And we see right here that those are not the same thing. So let's keep that in mind. All right, so an example of this happening right here. We have somebody who's golfing for some reason. I don't know, people still do this apparently. But um, they uh, he's applying some force with his putter. All right, and he's gonna try to put two different objects. The first object that he's trying to put is a golf ball. And as you see, that very first object there has a very small mass, tiny little m, okay? And so we have proportionate variables here. And if he uses the force of his putter on that tiny m, well, he's got a big A, it's going to accelerate with a high level there, right? A good, great magnitude for the acceleration. Now, if we take the emergency brake off and we assume that there's no friction here for this truck and he uses that same force, notice the F is the same size on a much larger mass, he's gonna have a much smaller acceleration. And the important thing here is that we notice the proportion and that the same force on different objects based on their mass will produce different accelerations, okay? And I love this little test tube. I don't know why, but every year this is one of my uh, favorite animations that I have in notes. So we got this guy up at the top. He's applying the force of his leg to the wall here. And uh, the wall's got such a large mass that it's not even accelerating at all. And we get an ouch. Whereas at the bottom, he's doing the same thing, but to a soccer ball. And we get fun because the mass is much less. So there's some sort of acceleration happening there. We got a quick example. We'll hit examples later on in class if necessary. Um, Newton's third law. You've heard this to some degree, I guarantee it. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This means that every force has a reactional force equal in size, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, which just means, as we talked about in kinematics, we flip the signs, okay? So if I were sitting in my chair that I'm in right now that has wheels on it, and I was right by the wall, and I pushed on the wall with a magnitude of 20 Newtons, the wall pushes on me back and has that opposite reaction with my hands with negative 20 Newtons, and I would accelerate in the opposite direction of the wall based on my mass to some degree, right? And off the top of my head, I don't know exactly what my mass in kilograms is. So we'll save that for some other time, all right? But that's what we're talking about here, equal and opposite. Remember that the direction just means positive and negative. Positive and negative just means direction. Okay? Um, so, an example right here. We've got a little rocket. We've got a model rocket happening right over here. And the rocket has an action. We light the engine for the rocket, and that is our action that's causing something to happen. The reaction, then, is a force equal to that produced by the rocket engine that's pushing in the opposite direction. Okay? Because the rocket engine is held inside of the actual rocket, that force becomes a mass traveling with some acceleration because force equals mass times acceleration. So we see the mass of the rocket accelerate because of the force generated by the engine. F equals MA in action right there. All right, and I couldn't resist. Isaac Newton, he slaps the roof of a car and that car, it slaps him right back, equal and opposite. All right, so gravity, um, our simplest force, our most common force, one that we are going to have to uh, look at a lot, a lot, a lot. So because Earth is by far the largest object that's close to you, um, your, your force of gravity there is typically measures the amount of attraction between you and the planet. And we'll get into gravitation in a minute, and it's very similar. I get that, gravity versus gravitation. But everything with mass is going to have some attraction towards each other because of gravity. But because the Earth is so much bigger than everything else, everything on the earth is pulled towards it. Now, if we look at our planetary body-sized people on the left here, we have Earth, Moon, Jupiter, and the Sun. We see that because they have very different masses, oh, I'm sorry, we are on Earth, Moon, Jupiter, and the Sun, excuse me, uh, apologies there. Um, a person with a mass, same person, same size, same mass all the way through there, is going to have a different weight on each of these different planets. That's because it's an interaction between the person's mass and the mass of the planet, and it's, that's what's going to derive the actual weight there. Now, you know the acceleration due to gravity because we've had kinematics. That's just here for us on Earth. If you go to the moon, the reason, as we've seen videos of people on the moon, yes, it really happened, um, you see them 
kind of skipping and, and bouncing up and down a little bit more is because the moon, as you see in this diagram, has less mass. So the weight of a person on the moon is going to be less and thus they're going to move much differently. And because your legs are used to pushing up on the weight, like this person here that you see of 623 newtons, when they only have to push up against the weight of 103 newtons, despite the fact that the person is the same mass, then you get that effect of bouncing around. All right, when we calculate our force of gravity, you know G is 9.8 meters per second squared. What direction? Down, right? Negative, we all know that. I didn't put that on here. Oh, all right, but that just means that our force is gonna be downwards for this case. So if our acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared, we know from Newton's second law that F equals MA, the force is mass times acceleration. We are then going to substitute in here to say that that force of gravity, also known as weight, Fg and weight are the same thing. It's just going to be mass times gravity. Since we know that now, if you are on Earth, we can make a direct proportion between mass and weight, and that proportion is just our g constant, gravitational acceleration. Okay, so if I had this equation here, Fg equals mg, and I say, okay, I want to find out what my weight is, and I know my mass, I can find it. If I want to know what my mass is, and I know my weight, I can find it, because we know g here on Earth. All right, quick example here. Um, I, I would have y'all all work through your own also, so maybe I'll say once I explain this quickly here, pause and see if you can find out what your mass is in kilograms. But I'm giving you a proportion here to go from weight and newtons to pounds. So one pound is equal to 4.45 newtons. My weight, maybe, we've been quarantining, so maybe not, um, is 225 pounds. And so multiplying that by 4.45 newtons, we get just over 1,000 newtons as my actual weight. If I wanted to find my mass in kilograms, I'm going to use that equation right there. Weight equals mass times gravity. And I'm going to solve for mass and realize that I'm just over 100 kilograms. And I'm going to go ahead and bet that nobody else watching this video is over 100 kilograms. But that's okay, because I'm big. All right, that's how you would find your mass, and that's how we would use this equation. Now, everything has this force of gravity pulling on it, pulling down, pulling in the direction towards the center of mass of the Earth, which is downwards for all of us in that negative direction, right? There's a reason, though, that we don't all collapse. and We don't all scoot into this tiny little infinitesimally small point in the middle of the Earth. And that's because of a component force known as the normal force. That sounds weird the first time you hear it. I absolutely understand hearing me say normal force is like, what in the heck is he talking about? You'll get very used to this. It's something that's always there. It's a component force perpendicular to a surface that prevents an object from falling. A great way to think about this is it's a support force from a structure of some kind or some other object that you're on, okay? So note the items on a desk. Wherever you're sitting right now, look at what's on the desk around you. They are not moving or being pulled downwards through the desk, and the desk is not collapsing because the desk is pushing back up. That is the normal force, okay? So whatever device you're watching this on right now, if you're holding it, you're holding it still. If it's sitting on a desk, it's sitting still. Gravity's pulling it down, but it's being pushed back up by some support force, okay? The desk is pushing back up in the example that you see here at the bottom. And if you're standing on the ground, the ground is pushing back up. Same thing, that's how this is all works. This, this all works. That has to be the case based on Newton's laws because we need to have a net force of zero. We need to be in an equilibrium situation. Otherwise, you'd be accelerating, okay? Oh. If weight is the opposite of the normal force, is it the abnormal force? Uh, uh, sorry, I can't resist sometimes. I know, that was a cringy one. My bad. All right. Um, so we talked about gravity. We need to hit gravitation. And gravi gravity comes from the concept of gravitation. And this looks a little more confusing, but I'm going to talk through this one real quick, too. These are linked to some degree, and one does lead to the other and back and forth. But gravitation is a force manifested by acceleration towards each other of two free material particles or bodies. What this one means is that objects in space, empty space, that have mass, have that attraction to each other still, and are going to pull towards each other based on a couple factors that you see down here at the bottom, okay? Okay. 
Newton's, uni Newton's law of universal gravitation is what defines all of that. So he even had another law. He actually had a whole bunch of stuff that he came out, but these are the big ones we're going to hit for this. So a particle attracts every other particle in the universe, every other particle in the universe, with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses, product multiplying, and indirectly proportional, divided by, the square of the distance between their centers. So we see that equation down here at the bottom, and we see numerous examples of that happening, right? So the gravitation force is G, and that big G is a constant. It's on your equation sheet. It's what makes this all work. G times the masses multiplied together divided by the radius squared. Now, this really helps us out because it also explains why objects that are very far away have very little effect on us because radius being squared means it has a significantly greater effect, especially at large values than the mass, okay? And this is why even though the sun is more massive than the earth, we are much closer to the earth. This is why gravity holds us here as opposed to point us towards the sun. And speaking of the earth and the sun, it's also what keeps those things relatively close to each other and one rotating around the other. Okay, so to define a little more, and we'll get more into that in just a sec, because this helps us lead to orbits and how that stuff works also. But gravity, this is objects of drastically different sizes, and I want to define the difference. And this isn't, I'm not going to say that this is like a super technical definition. This is, this is my definition more than anything else, okay? Gravity are objects of drastically different sizes, us compared to the Earth, right? Many, many, many factors of 10 difference in sizes. So one object's pull on the other overpowers the smaller object's pull to the point where one force becomes negligible, okay? So we looked, it's about a thousand newtons that the earth is pulling on me. But because I'm pulling up with a thousand newtons on the earth, but there's also buildings up here and other people and everything else pulling on it, it overall has no effect on the earth as a whole. Whereas gravitation are objects of similar sizes, okay? They're pulling each other with forces great enough that neither force can be ignored. And so that is the idea of not just the sun pulling on the earth, but the earth pulling on the sun. And an interesting concept here, I'm, I'm looking around for an object that I can use as an example. If this is the sun and we have the earth rotating around it, the sun is not stationary. It actually does a little wobble. Because when it's here, it pulls it this way. But when it's back over here, it pulls it back that way. And that goes for every object in the solar system. So it wobbles a little bit as all these objects move around it. The sun is never stationary. Not just that, it's actually moving through the universe as a whole as well. But those things are close enough in size that they proportionally can pull on each other. The Earth is much closer to the size of the sun than we are to the size of the Earth. This leads to very different constants in your calculations. Right, the gravity constant is dependent on the size of the greater mass because that's the only one that really has a powerful effect here. The gravitation constant always is the same because the masses are included in the calculation. Okay, Normally I would do a unit analysis. Lucky you, you don't have to do that right now. But uh, if you see, that's our G, our gravitation constant there. And that takes into effect the mass, the um, distances, and time as things move and rotate. All right, you see those crazy units, don't even worry about those units. It makes the equation work. That's the important part there, okay? All right, now to talk about how objects stay in orbit because of gravity. Orbit is the gravitationally curved trajectory of an object, um, such as the trajectory of a planet around a star. Objects' orbits um, are said to be all, so objects in orbit, excuse me, um, and this quote, I think, really helped me out. It's from NASA, so I wanted to give them credit, but I think that's really helpful in seeing what's going on, right? The objects in orbit are said to always be falling toward the planet, but because they're moving at such a high speed, they never actually hit the planet. So if we look in this bottom right diagram here, I think this one does a great job of pulling it. This object that's maybe a, a satellite orbiting around the Earth, is moving and we set it into, into its path, its orbit, very quickly, right? So it's moving this direction. But also then you've got the pull of gravity in this direction. And so there's some combined force that's taken it this way and that continuously happens and changes as it moves around, which keeps it in orbit. 
So if the velocity were to greatly change for whatever reason, it runs into something and encounters some sort of resistance, that velocity could change it. And then it's likely to fall out of orbit because it's not going fast enough to continuously be moving sideways and stay in that location. Okay, this is why it would be very bad if a meteor or something else were to hit Earth, because we would lose our trajectory, our velocity, and fall towards the sun. And for obvious reasons, I think that's disastrous. Okay, Kepler's laws help define these orbits. And so we're going to mention these briefly in this unit, and then we'll revisit this a little bit when we start talking about some circular motion stuff. The first one is the law of ellipses which actually says we don't travel in perfect circular orbits around anything. We actually travel in what's known as an ellipse. An ellipse is a circle-like shape that has um, two foci in the middle of it. So to look at the very basic one right here, you have the center and then the actual circular object. Think it's not quite egg-shaped. It's more symmetrical than that, but close. It's got to focus on both sides. And it's about those, those foci that we actually are concerned with the uh, different orbit here, right? So the a planet actually moving here might be moving in the orbit around the outside here, and it's going to be closer to and further away from the sun at different times. All right, our next law, Kepler's second law, is the law of equal areas. It describes the speed at which objects orbit and that that's constantly changing. And this is why I'm going to save large parts of this for the circular motion unit. So we'll cover this because gravity drives it, but we'll look more at how those speeds are affected once we get to circular motion. Um, orbital patterns can be broken up into triangles of equal areas, and they are covered in an equal amount of time. So because we were... Um, oh, oh, excuse me. Because we were at this point where we had these two foci, it's not right in the middle. We end up with these different areas that you can see um, are then going to be equal overall. So to move from A to B takes the same amount of time as to move from C to D. So if you get a very wide orbit, you end up with long amounts of time where um, you're covering relatively small distances. And as you get closer to that central object that you're orbiting around, you're going to be moving faster and uh, cover more distance than over that amount of time. Okay, again, we'll expand upon this later. And then the law of harmonies are, is Kepler's third law. And this really just brings those other two together and shows a proportion that's relatively constant for all orbiting bodies. And that proportion is the T there, the time, the period of an orbit squared divided by the average radius of the orbit cubed. All right, so we see Kepler's third law equation down there, and you see the examples in our universe, or in our universe, excuse me, in our solar system. You see the period of all these different planets. You see the average distance from the sun for all these different planets. And when this equation is applied to each one of them, it's roughly one for every single one. The T squared divided by the R cubed is roughly one if the value for T is years and the value for radius is astronomic units. And we'll talk more about that later too. We'll probably use more um, meters, but that's used to relatively make the values easier to see and understand. All right, so Kepler's laws, we'll get back to those and we'll cover that briefly later on in this unit. To take us back to forces as a whole and uh, our more basic forces that are gonna interact more with us here on earth, we have the force of friction. And clearly you got to watch for ice because ice can have a low level of friction. And even this polar bear, he's going sliding, right? So friction is a force that is exerted as two objects in contact move past each other. If you take your hands real quick, put them together, rub them together. Friction force as your hands move against each other is causing thermal energy to be released and why your hands get warm, okay? With, if your hands were perfectly smooth, that wouldn't happen. There wouldn't be that friction force happening there to the same level as if there's ridges on them, which are your fingerprints, okay? This typically resists motion, and different materials are going to have different amounts of this resisting force. So the material present is going to make a big, big difference. Ice having a low level of friction, something like a gravel road would have a very high level of friction. Two types, all right? Friction is going to act differently when an object is standing still than when an object is moving. It is harder to start the motion of a stationary object than to keep the motion of an object continuing. Okay? So static friction is the force that resists initial movement of an object. 
Static being still, being stationary, meaning not moving. Kinetic friction is the force that continues to resist the movement of an object once it is already moving. And kinetic, just think kinematics, right? Same thing, Mo moving, motion, that's what we've got going on there. Static friction will always be greater than kinetic friction, always. If in one of your calculations, you get a greater kinetic friction than static friction, you've made a mistake. You've broken physics, and that's not possible so far as the existence of every human being that's ever lived has been able to tell us. So this is because it's harder to start an object moving than it is to keep it moving. Um, we've got here some constants um, for, uh, sorry, trying to make it so you can see what's going on. Um, some different constants for static and kinetic friction. Um, the coefficient of friction is what helps us describe how much friction is present for these different objects, all right? Um, it's going to be a proportion of forces based on the surface that's present. So it's a numerical representation of the amount of friction between objects. Um, because different materials produce different amounts of friction, these coefficients are going to be based on the two substances in contact. Now, there is an infinite number of coefficients of friction. Okay? I could have one very specific type of rubber. Whatever I try to move it against, it's going to have some different level of friction. And that is the case for every different object that there is, period. Not just that, that rubber, the surface of the rubber is going to make a difference. If it's flat, then it's just the substance. If it's curved and wavy, it's going to have a different level of friction then. If it's partially broken apart, it's going to have, like, every single thing is going to be slightly different. These are not standard. These are averages that you see here in this table. So note that this column, always greater than this column. That mu s, mu stands for our coefficient of friction. Okay, it's like a little cursive u, it's a Greek letter. Uh, s is static, k kinetic. And notice these are always greater, right? And then things like steel on steel, um, uh, they don't move very well together. I mean, you probably hear that horrible screeching noise just based on, uh, on me saying that out loud. But then you look down here, ice on ice, I mean, that slides really well together, right? Synovial joints in humans, you actually have lubricant in your joints that allow your shoulders and stuff to move smoothly. And if that's not the case and this number goes up, then it's because you have arthritis. So there you go. That's what's happening there. Um, these numbers should almost always be between zero and one. Now you see very rough surfaces here, 1.5. That's like so rough that they are designed to stick together. Think glue or a suction device, or something like that, that is the only time you'll have a coefficient of friction over one. In practical use, it will always be between zero and one. I'm going to move myself back up here. All right, so when we are calculating friction, um, we know that friction is dependent on the material in contact with each other. We just talked about that. Um, and I would ask normally all these questions here, but we're going to jump ahead. We'll maybe hit this another time. But um, I want to talk about how we calculate friction. So the force of friction is going to be equal to that proportion, that mu, times the normal force. In a lot of cases, gravity and the normal force are going to be the same. Again, an object resting on a desk, gravity pulling it down, the normal force pushing up are the same. We'll talk about cases when they're not as we continue through this unit. But most of the time, they're the same. Don't always assume that they're the same, but most of the time they will be. Two calculations may be necessary. You might have to calculate the static friction, in which case you would use mu s there. You would just replace that mu with whatever your static coefficient is. And the kinetic friction, you would make it mu k, so you would replace that one in that case. It's going to depend on whether or not the object is stationary or moving, static or kinetic. All right, uh, we're getting close to the end. Y'all are hanging in. This is going great. Um, I assume it's going great. You're watching this at home. But uh, the net force here is something I want to talk about quickly. This is very simple, looking at vectors, but it's very important as far as vectors are going here. And we'll talk a lot about this through the unit, but I want to make sure we hit net force quickly. So when analyzing an object in motion um, with more than one force acting on it, remember we have to combine those forces. It's important also to remember your vectors and that directions are just positive and negative. So you see with the top one there, because we have two vectors that are each five units, we get a total of 10 because they're pointed in the same direction, but we have two vectors in the second one, also five units each, 
we end up with zero because one is pointed in that opposite direction. So keep this stuff in mind. Make sure you are realizing that the direction of the vectors are very, very important and the direction is just positive and negative. Again, typically to the right, positive x-axis, positive, negative x-axis, negative, up, positive, down, negative. And we've got a couple of net force calculations here. I'm going to take, let you take a look at that real quick and just think about what's going on. But if you look, two people pushing in the same direction, a greater force, two people pushing opposite directions, a negative force. And then when you've got a net force at an angle, we're going to have this object on the far right there, the third object. It's actually going to be moving up and to the right at the same time. It's going to follow a path that's the same direction as the net force. So it's going to accelerate in that direction. All right. Equilibrium is really, I don't want to say the opposite of that, but it's kind of those objects, uh, those forces when they cancel each other out, right? So as mentioned early on, net force being equal to zero is the state of equilibrium. So each of these examples that you see down here at the bottom, because they have equal forces that then cancel out to make zero force in all directions, we have a state of equilibrium. Now here's what's important. A state of equilibrium means the net force is zero. That does not mean that it's stationary. Okay, I'm gonna let that sink in for just a second. All right, having a net force of zero does not mean stationary. It just means no acceleration. You could still be traveling at a constant velocity if you have no acceleration. An example, I take a hockey puck. I slide it across the ice. Okay, now ice we know has low level of friction. Once it gets moving, it's going just like that, right? If it's moving at a constant velocity, it's moving because I gave it that push to begin with, but then friction is also happening between the ice, a very, very small amount, but that's still driving for, pulling back on it to some degree. So we could have that force applied causing no acceleration because there's a constant velocity. The term constant velocity is very important in this unit. All right, the same way that we talked about launched horizontally in kinematics, that tells you a lot. Constant velocity for this unit tells you an acceleration of zero and is a very important note to make. All right, now we got to remember Newton. And I know he's got, he's got a quite a nose on him, right? I don't know why, he just always has. Um, well, he did a long time ago, we should say it that way. But a reminder that F equals MA. So if there's an unbalanced force, not an equilibrium state, then the object that the force is acting on must be accelerating. That acceleration can be found using Newton's second law and a tricky physics teacher hint, which I kind of gave you there just on the last slide, but no acceleration doesn't mean no motion. An object can be in motion at a constant velocity and still have no acceleration. Okay, our last item here, how we're gonna show forces. We're gonna do things a little bit differently with our diagrams in this unit than we did with uh, kinematics because we actually are going to really truly define um, what it means to have our forces drawn together. Okay, so first thing we've got here is a force diagram. Well, really here we see the progression of all of these things. But a force diagram is a visual representation of all the forces acting on an object. It's important to be sure that we have all of these things in the correct directions. So if you're not sure what direction something might be acting in, um, that forces table, the different types of forces from the very beginning of these notes might be a helpful thing to look back at. But uh, what we've got here, we have just a, a mountain climber hanging on the left. That's the true image of what's happening. In the middle, we have what's known as a force diagram. And on the right, we have what's known as a free body diagram. And I'm gonna explain both of those, okay? So the mountain climber's hanging there. He's, he's got gravity pulling down on him for sure. He's got the rope pulling up because he's not falling, looks to be in a state of equilibrium. He's got his foot against the wall to keep from swinging into it. So he's pushing off, pushing there, right? And then because his foot is on the wall and there's a rubber sole to his shoe, there's some amount of friction there as well. And you see all those objects marked and in the direction that they'd be acting because his foot would be pulling down there, re friction is opposite in direction um, going up. All those objects acting right from where they are actually truly acting and in the correct directions. That is a force diagram shows where forces act on objects. A free body diagram is literally free of the body associated with this object. So we've taken the person out and we've used our tip to tail method 
as we talked about in kinematics, to put all of our vectors together, to have all of our positive vertical vectors added together there. You see the friction and the tension both pulling up. Our negative vertical vectors down, just gravity. And then we have just the force there pushing out to the left, no force pushing to the right. So what this means is this guy's pushing off the cliff. The cliff is pushing back, and thus he would swing out to some degree based on where he is right there because there that force would cause him to accelerate in the negative x direction. Okay? So um, I want you to pause these real quick. Just grab a piece of scratch paper and uh, see what you can come up with with these, um, and I'll come back and then uh, and, and let you see what the true example would be for a force diagram. So it could just be on a scratch piece of paper, um, open up a jam board and just draw on that real quick. But our first example here, draw a force diagram for a car as it drives down the road. All right, I want you to actually draw this. Pause, do it. All right, now that you've drawn this and you're done pause, um, we're gonna take a look at what it actually looks like here, okay? So we have our... Let me get my face out of the way again. Our car. And in consideration here are all the different things happening. And remember, for a force diagram, we're actually drawing these forces where they are acting. So there's some sort of thrust force, driving force, causing the car to move forward. As it moves forward, there's friction between the tires and the ground. There is also that reactionary force that's keeping it from falling through the road that counteracts the weight. So the weight is pulling down, and you see the reaction force, the normal force, in this case, pushing back up at the location of the tires. Now we're gonna consider weight to always be acting from that center of mass. So the center of the weight of the car is gonna be right in the middle there, and so it's gonna be pulling down from right in the middle there, all right? The last thing to note, and the reason that when you put your hand out the window of a car, you feel the air and the wind rushing by you is because there is air resistance. Now we leave it out of most of our calculations as we've mentioned previously in kinematics, but it is still there and you can see that that's accounted for. And it's actually something that's really accounted for if you're going at a high velocity in a vehicle for a long amount of time. You've seen the wind pieces wrap around the large semi trucks and things like that to cut down on air resistance. That can save truck drivers hundreds and thousands of dollars on gas costs as they're driving long distances because that's it's cutting down on that air resistance as it hits the car okay all right so we got another one coming up here so again i'm going to tell you what it is and then i want you to pause it and try it one more time so example number two draw a force diagram for a runner as they go for a jog so pause draw this force diagram all right now that you pause and you've done your drawing, I want to take a look at what we've actually got going on here, okay? So we still have this person moving, and so we have air resistance to some degree. Now what I'll say is whenever we have an object that has mass, I'm going to suggest you start with weight, right? Because that's going to happen from the center of mass. It's going to be the easiest thing to, uh, to mention here. Now we are just looking at the external forces acting on this person. Okay, are they moving their arms up and down? Probably, but we're not worried about the force for that because it's internal. We're looking at the external forces. So weight going downwards, normal force pushing up on the foot there to make sure that this person is not falling through the ground. Air resistance hitting them in the front. Now the friction force is what drives motion when you are walking or running. Okay, so you put your foot down on the ground and you actually push backwards, which would be an internal force, but then the interaction of the bottom of your shoe or your foot with the ground is what actually pushes you forward. That interaction is friction. And so friction is actually what's driving the motion in this case. Now that friction force here, so long as your foot doesn't slip on the ground, is going to be equal and opposite your push. So next time you go walking, just think about it for a sec. You put your foot down, what direction do you push to make yourself go forward? And you'll see that this is actually correct. All right, so to go back to our big ideas, we had one, two, three, and four. You should have seen objects and systems with mass constantly throughout this. Um, we should have seen fields existing, specifically gravitational fields. You should have seen interaction described by forces. It's so what we just did two diagrams of, so you definitely saw that, and then interactions between systems that are going to result in the changes, and that's what we'll use applicably for this, is we're going to apply a force to a system and see how it changes those systems. So hopefully you saw those as we did this, hopefully you uh, got the material you needed, and we will cover this much more in depth as we get into the unit.